Hola, ¿me escuchan? Hi. Buenas tardes. Can you hear me? ¿Cómo están? Good afternoon. Eh, How are you? Bueno, um, ya salió el banquero. Well, okay, <laughs> the, the bankers gone. The bankers are gone. Well, turns out I also work at a bank. De, but different to Rogerio, who knows this event and has been participating. Es this is my third Estuve time, Quito, barely. I, eh, I was here in Quito. En el I was virtually in 2020. Tengo el gusto and today, it is my ustedes. great pleasure to join you once again. Pero ¿por qué les digo esto? But why did I bring that Porque up? Creo que Because I believe that we're also normal. working towards a new normal. normal. That new normal, in the sense esta, that in sectorial conferences like this one, un tourism, you should have a panel on climate bueno, change. When I started working on climate no change, there were not too many es más, panels on climate change. As a matter of fact, the panels I attended were all environmentalists. They were experts on climate change. And we always tried to see how we could help further Ojo. that agenda. Sin embargo, However, cosas many things have happened years. over the last few days. Pero well, actually, un un <laughs> over rápido, the last 10 years, I would say. But I'm going to go very quickly over the important milestones that we have crossed to see then where we are and where you need to go, because we need every single one to work on this. Some of you might recall that back in 2009, there was a COP, the COP, the Conference of the Parties in Copenhagen. It was considered a failure. Why a failure? Obama was there. Many presidents attended, a lot of people. The Kyoto Protocol was finally defined, and that was the moment at which we had to define how we would move forward, how we would go from a division between rich and poor countries, or developed and in, uh, developing countries, in order, in order for everyone to have a commitment towards climate change. Did, we didn't make it. What we did get was that the developed countries did have a goal. They said that as of 2020, they would contribute $100,000. No. $100,000 million, that would be, what, 10, 100 million, 100 billion? And the thing is that we did not reach the $100 billion in 2020. And many developed countries said, well, it was because of the pandemic. But you need to know that the resources going to the subsidies of fossil fuels, we're talking about trillions per year. So what we're saying is that there is no real alignment between incentives, between development uh, development and the agenda on climate change. But let's move forward. What happened in 2015? COP21, Conference of the Parties, for the first time, developed and developing countries committed themselves to having a net zero goal. I will tell you what net zero means, but they committed to a net zero goal. We all said that the NDCs, we need to contribute with plans to contribute to the improvement of the emissions, and then they started working on what they call the rule book, how it moved closer to articles, and it was Madrid. Well, it was Chile originally, 2019, social crisis in Chile, so they moved over to Madrid. And there was one article to be defined, which was defined now at the COP26 in Glasgow in 2020. Actually. This COP, which not only included that rule book defining finally Article 6 on carbon market, but also that for the first time in history, out of 26 years of negotiations, they finally mentioned fossil fuel. For the first time, fossil fuel and coal generation of energy through coal for the first time. And the third point was that for the first time, they committed not to go beyond 1.5 degrees centigrade. Okay, so you might say, okay, done, we're done. Guess what? No. 
Let me tell you where we stand. In as much as at the level of negotiations we achieved some important progress, that does not mean that we have managed to revert the trend that we have, that as of today, according to a study from the UNDP, the, mission, the emissions gap, which uh, was issued in uh, October, just before the COP26, it is saying that we, are, we have a 66% chance of living in a world above the 1.5. A degree centigrade. And it said that basically we were in a tendency to a three degree world. There are indeed some commitments that are not amid the legal commitment. And then they said, okay, these other commitments from companies and from municipalities could manage, reduce it to 2.7, maybe 2.5. Well, we're still far away from that. The impact of two degrees is coral, all of it will die. We will have four months of drought per year. Sea level will increase by 56 centimeters, and there will be many more wildfires like those in Canada, California and the heat waves which we have already seen and that all has a direct impact on your business with the cop many countries came up to say that they had some other net zero goals and then Climate Track was an independent organization and it recognized that if those commitments were implemented, we might get to a world of 1.8. We're still not below the 1.5. But it is important for me to highlight that point about if they were implemented. We know what we need to do. We all know it. We need to stop having subsidies for fossil fuel. We need to electrify the automotive sector. We need to decarbonize electricity. We need to strengthen our forests, particularly in the Americas. We have to improve efficiencies in the construction sector. We need to increase our resilience and the capacity for restoration of ecosystems. We know what the solutions are, and we know that many of these solutions have an, a, multiplying, a multiplying effect that is much greater than business as usual. A recent study says that the multiplying effect on economy of sustainable use of the soil is six times greater than deforestation. However, we continue to deforest. But not only do we have a problem with mitigation in order to reduce emissions, we have a problem with adaptation, and our region is particularly vulnerable to climate change. In the IDB, IADB, IDB, Inter-American Development Bank, we ran a study which told us that we would need to invest $100 billion per year in order to respond to the changes affected by climate change. If today we could invest and revise, if we invest those 100 billion today, we will avoid, uh, we will save an investment of four dollars in the future. For for everything that we invest today, we will uh, for every dollar that we invest today, we will save four dollars in the future. Now we do know that there are many businesses globally which are already investing in resilience services, monitoring with new technologies. We need to bear in mind that many changes can come, can turn our assets in stagnant assets. That means that even if I invested and I think that I will be operating for 10 years, for, in, for instance, a gas plant, that gas plant, because of a relationship of, of emissions reduction, I will only operate for five years, I will have a stagnant asset. So we need to maintain the value of the assets, and for that we need to invest in climate change. Christian was just telling us, we have to act now in five years, in 10, in 50. I'm here to tell you that we need to act now. We only have eight years before this, having no way back. That 66% chance from the United Nations report, it starts shrinking. And the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, says that we only have four years. Four years is nothing. 
not. And the investments that you may make today, if you don't take into consideration climate change, you will probably turn them into a stagnant asset. So for me, the first message that I want to share with you is that you need to act today, not in five, not in 10 years, today on climate change. But not only to have a press release or a commitment which will be disseminated internationally and it will pop up in the papers and it is exclusively linked to climate change. We need to understand that climate change is one more variable in the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. We need to have a well-rounded application of the plans that we have, sustaining sustainability from the beginning, because that sustainability will lead you to avoid input problems. You will not have market distortions. You will not have social problems that will cause your operations to be halted. So the message here is that inasmuch as I am I'm talking about climate change, when you start designing your plants, those plants have to be integrated. But I have a good news. I have some good news. It is not just a cost. It is also an opportunity. We will be discussing this in our panel. But Experts say there are 50 trillion, meaning that is 50 billion, 50,000 50, billion dollars, that's what it is. They were estimating 1.2 trillion. If you focus only on cities, it is considered that you can attract 5 trillion dollars. But it's not just this. You have benefits in cost, savings in energy, for instance. But furthermore, capital cost. Sana was talking about the sustainability link loans. We are also doing those, basically linking the financing to a KPI, a KPI that if you do it, you will reduce your capital cost. Furthermore, you have other opportunities, such as the opportunity of installing electric mobility chargers, which will attract a consumer who spends more. And you can attract them to your place. And obviously, it will give you a reputation. It will give reputation to your brand. So then, there is an opportunity. But beyond the opportunity, I will talk to you about three trends that will be affecting your activities in the future. And I'm going to move faster because I see that the clock is running. The whole world is looking for this type of investment. There is a net zero banking alliance, then there was a net zero asset managers initiative, and now there is a net zero asset owner alliance. All of this began. All of these became combined because they were moving at different paces in what we call the GFANS, which was launched now at the COP26, which is the Glasgow Financial Alliance to Net Zero. What does this mean? More and more, not only development bank, but also private bank, is beginning to work on their net zero strategies. That means that they want coherence on what they are financing. They don't just want to finance wind farms on the one side and fossil fuels on the other hand. They want to align all of these and work on what they call the alignment with Paris. We, as uh, IADB, we also committed that everything we finance will be aligned with Paris. Those global trends, those initiatives, um, here I have on screen a couple of examples as to how private banks, regional banks, even some groups are generating specific products to be able to achieve your goals, which perhaps are handed down by the headquarters in order to have sustained development. And tourism was not left behind. Many of you may know that at the COP, we, they sound the 
Glasgow Declaration on Climate Action. That was uh, another part of the global strategy on net race to zero, which was focusing on real economy. Previously, I mentioned everything that was going on in the financial sector, but in the real economy, in the race to zero, headed by Gonzalo Muñoz and Nigel Topping, they generated this alliance of the economy with the different companies that reach 50% of the global GDP in order to reduce emissions to 2030. The tourism sector committed itself to reducing the emissions to 2030 in half and to be net zero by 2050. And Panama, for instance, is part of the signatories to this Glasgow commitment. And that Glasgow commitment speaks of five, but mainly it speaks about the fact that we need to measure our carbon footprint, we need to eliminate carbon or coal, and we have to regenerate. But besides that, we need to draft action plans and we need to collaborate and unlock finance. There is another trend that we are also seeing that was already going on before COVID and which has become strengthened, that society itself, there is a trend to want to seek those organizations to work or those organizations to consume those products that may be the companies should be net zero, meaning that the future customers, but also the future employees have these trends. And net zero future means that we need to reduce emissions, that we can no longer let the fossil fuel industries do it. We all need to work as the race to zero proved, and we need to decarbonize. And there is a time in which, yes, it is like a balance. In net zero, I need to reduce emissions, and at some time I will have to compensate. But that compensation that I have through carbon bonds or through the market of Article 6 of Paris will be under a spyglass to watch out for greenwashing. Society is aware of the fact that, uh, that there is greenwashing and they want to avoid it. And also, I have to mention that we should not forget about adaptation, and that is one of the fascinating things about this sector. And reading through a study, it says that the DNA of the tourism sector is adaptation. You adapted to COVID, you can adapt to other impacts, and you will also, regrettably, also adapt to whether there is still a problem in Europe, Ukraine, Ukraine, rather. But you have to think longer term and start adapting to climate change impact. In the end, what we need is us all to make a promise Yes, but with a plan. We need to increase everyone's ambition, but with accountability. Because otherwise, there are three sectors that will not be happy, or maybe they will be very happy. Investors, consumers, clients, and employees of today and the employees of the future. Because the in the end, the only way to build our future is to invest in it.